My argument today is that we need two new words to talk about finishing. So I'm going to borrow one from mathematics and one from art. This is the first time you will hear either of them dedicated to the idea of finishing something, so you'll have to take my word for it, or rather my two words for it. I must thank my reviewers for their positive support, but they made two suggestions that concerned me. One suggested that Limbo was in purgatory. Another reviewer recommended Henderson's book on the fourth dimension, but Henderson has a problem with the history of topology. A lot of people say that topology began with Euler's Königsberg bridge problem, which is, can you cross seven bridges only one time? But this is actually not about topology at all. Way too many people have been saying this, so let me clarify. Euler's solution was the beginning of graph theory, actually. What people call rubber sheet geometry is actually affine geometry, not the kind we need for talking about art or architecture. It's what you get if you subtract distance and angle from Euclid. What we need is called projective geometry, which is about non-orientation and self-intersection, like the Mobius band. It is actually logically prior to Euclid, so it would be more accurate to call Euclidean geometry non-projective rather than topology non-Euclidean. Projective geometry's history begins with the theorems of Pappus of Alexandria in 300 AD and gets picked up by the architect Girard de Sargue in the 1600s, also Pascal. This is about what's called the real projective plane, a two-dimensional manifold of surfaces such as the Mobius band, torus, and Klein bottle. After a century of neglect, it was picked up again by a troop of mathematicians such as Euler, Plücker, Gauss, and Riemann. The 19th century was the century of topology, but by the end of it all, this was gone. It became quantum mechanics. To finish in Euclidean terms, the leftovers must lie in the same space they were found. The Hamiltonian is a circuit that includes everything, negatives, latencies, and virtualities because it must include itself in its own inventory, itself intersecting and non-oriented, like the interior eight. There are two aspects to the projective topology of the Hamiltonian. In two space, there is literally no room for an observer. So we could say that it's invisible, just 2D forms intersecting themselves in non-oriented ways but we can picture toruses, Mobius bands, and we can even buy Klein bottles on the internet. But these are immersions of projective forms, a kind of localized addition. Going between the invisibility of 2D space to the immersed 3D creates a parallax of viewability, but it's a rather unusual kind of parallax. Immersion is the local form of the global idea of the Hamiltonian. A quick way to remember this is that almost everything we call uncanny is a local case of the Hamiltonian. And we can use Escher's funny staircase to remember that the local will always involve a combination of contradictory forces, such as both going up and going down. This is called the contronym as we find more in ancient languages where words like sacred mean both revered and despised. The list of topics in what I would call Escher formations is engaging because it's all the stuff that's interesting. All of them are topological in the sense that they involve self-reference and contradiction, the hallmark of projective geometry. Just look at the items on this list. There's nothing here that's not a great dissertation topic. But by the same token, everything here combines the uncanny with topology. So don't use Henderson as your main source. Talk instead about immersion and the need for a second kind of parallax. If I were to give a very short course on the localized Escher formation, it would be a stereogram. This is the pattern that you stare at while looking at infinity. The pattern folds over itself to produce a 3D shape. 
This is how the Escher happens inside ordinary space as a kind of miracle using our parallax interaction to emerge as a kind of origami fold. The magic inherent to this uncanny emergence is that the topology that created it remains behind as a latent or virtual force that continues to astonish every time it breaks Euclidean expectations. It's been used a lot over the centuries and is still the quickest way to get a laugh or astonish an audience. The Escher construct is really a contronym put into visual or architectural terms, and thus it's a bit of ancient magic that leaks into modern times. By far the most universal Escher construct is also the most contronymic, but as luck would have it, it's also the most architectural. This is the interval every culture recognizes when the soul, after literal death, has trouble adopting to the idea of being dead. Usually, the interval involves 40, the number of quarantine. The non-fully dead soul encounters trials and must pass a final exam before getting rest. The Theseian labyrinth has been the most popular monogram for this interval. Its topology negates inside and outside because there are no choices and no locked doors, yet it's the perfect prison. Other architectures compete with Daedalus with the same basic design. The so-called Little Babel, although I see nothing little about it, and Venus's mountain of moral choices. Uh, I don't see anything moral about it either. This is also called CB's Table, which has a very curious, even macabre, history. The story goes that CB's table was an image placed in the shadows at the back of a temple. Pilgrims asking to see it would be told that it came with a curse. If they understood it, they would be given perfect wisdom, but if they didn't, they would be driven mad. This connected to the common trope of the day, that the genius was either a god or a devil, no in-between. This is a new kind of parallax, self-intersecting and non-oriented, a model of the perfect genius. This whole thing is the topology of the labyrinth, a monster on the inside, and a post-victory escape plan. The fractal design means that it was also non-orientable, combining centrifugal and centripetal movements in one concentric design. All Escher formations are basically concentric. They emerge and radiate out, but rituals radiate in. They maintain the idea of opposition or twoness. Classical heroes begin as sets of twins, one mortal, the other immortal, meaning dead. So when we look at ancient cities, always founded by heroes, we also expect the theme of doubles, who are also antagonists. Possibly the most famous double heroes, also related to the most famous foundation myth, are Romulus and Remus. As you know, one gets killed, the other becomes king. But this isn't just about sibling rivalry. Ancient kingship was conceived as a relation between a mortal ruler and an immortal shadow double. The sacrifice of one twin is essential to the story, and in the foundation of Rome, it's a key detail. When Romulus plowed a furrow to mark the placement of the walls, he created a special cut called catagraphine, an ancient term designating magical boundaries that allowed inside and outside to communicate on certain conditions. When Remus mocked the pomerium cut, he became the designated non-survivor, the sacrifice necessary to consecrate the boundary. But this ritual had to be renewed regularly, no one was allowed to build over this space. The two walls on either side protected both the walls and the city by trapping spiritual invaders. Essentially, it was a torus, self-intersecting and non-orientable. According to Roman law, this space was actually the only actual city of Rome. The spaces to either side were just territories. My thesis is not an attempt to connect anything, but to find in the architecture of early cultures whatever is there to be inventoried, following the idea of the Hamiltonian and the Escher formation. Concentricity, without and in happening at the same time, 
with non-oriented self-intersection happening all the time, the Escher localities of the Hamiltonian idea of completion structured all of what we would call service voids of early cultures. Like the Taurus, these had two voids, one continent, the other incontinent, or like Romulus and Remus, one mortal, the other immortal. Why? Because in early cultures, containment was the key issue. You could not perfectly contain yourself without being imprisoned, a form of premature burial. But you could not include good spirits without including bad ones, slipping in at the same time. The two-void design was imperative. This design was integrated into the rituals, performances, settlement designs, and dynamics of household interiors, where each family localized its own religion at the point of the hearth and the flame that connected to the ancestral dead. 